for a kind of sacrifice that we would be unwilling to make ourselves. But you've made us gracious beneficiaries of. What increases our joy on Easter is to focus on what you've done for us on Friday. So we turn our gaze to a cross to see what you have done on our behalf. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Everyone said, you may be seated. Just in case you're interested, there is childcare available for children up to eight years old for tonight. So Easter is the day that we love to celebrate. It's not just the promise of life because we have that right now. It's not just the promise of new life, though when a baby is born, we all celebrate that. It's not just the promise of extended life because uh, maybe a doctor gave us a prognosis and some kind of way to help extend our life, some kind of treatment. It's resurrected life. And here's the challenge, is that the term resurrection gives an indication that there must be, there must be a death. And that's where we begin to struggle. Uh, when you look at the week of Jesus, heading into Good Friday. It was a pretty packed full week. Actually, it started with a triumphal entry, uh, Palm Sunday into Jerusalem. And that was followed by him going in and cleansing the temple for a second time in his ministry. Um, he just believed that his father's house should be a place of prayer, not a place where people created barriers to God, but helped build bridges to him, not a place where people would just repeat recited words that they'd memorize, but actually have conversations with God. And then one day on the way out of Jerusalem, he curses a fig tree. And when they saw it the next day, it had withered and died. That wound up being an object lesson of faith for his disciples. Then he took his disciples to the Mount of Olives. And uh, this is uh, really interesting. While they're sitting outside the city from the Mount of Olives, you can see the city and the temple. And he begins to give them warnings of things to come, foretelling some of the things that they will go through. He tells them that the beautiful temple that they can see from that location one day will be torn down and not one stone will be left upon another. He tells them that the world will not always be tolerant of communities of faith, that there will actually come persecution. He tells them that there's actually going to be something that occurs in the world where politics is brought into religious worship centers in a way that divide people and they feel betrayed by one another and they begin to hate each other. He also tells us that there's, there's going to be uh, not only wars and rumors of wars, he tells us that there's going to be pandemics. And when I say things like that, there are people who have a natural response. Pastor, I know you're trying to make our culture fit that, but the world has had all of those things since the time of Jesus into now, and that's absolutely true. The difference about our time is we thought our technology and our medical capacity gave us an exemption from those kinds of things, and we were wrong. He foretold all of these things in that same week, he washed his disciples' feet, which was off-putting to some of the disciples because their model of leadership didn't allow someone to roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. He established the Lord's Supper, something we're going to celebrate and enter into at the end of our service tonight. He actually told his closest friends that he couldn't be alone on that night and he went into a garden to pray and he prayed with such agony that it's hard to describe and yet his closest friends fell asleep in the middle of it. He was betrayed by a kiss, he was arrested in the dark, he was abandoned by his friends, he was tried and he was crucified. And it's the trials of Jesus that I would actually like to spend some time on tonight. In Matthew chapter 26, 
beginning in verse 57, it says, those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes. How many think it'd be pretty traumatic to see the pastor in a service tear their clothes? It's not going to happen here tonight. And he said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do you need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. And then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists and others slapped him and said, prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you? The Sanhedrin was a group of 70 religious leaders who had been who had deeply studied scripture and had been educated in the ways of God. And it also included a, a high priest. This is the group that brought Jesus in for a trial. This is the group that made a secret arrangement with Judas to be able to apprehend Jesus in the garden at night. And they set up false witnesses to come in, but they didn't prep them very well. And their testimonies were so bad that even a biased room wouldn't convict Jesus of death. Finally, they found two people who said something that they could hang something on. They said that they heard Jesus plotting to destroy the temple, an act of domestic terrorism. There's a passage in John where he actually talked about the destruction of the temple and being rebuilt in three days, but it even says there he was talking about his body and not a building. But through all of this, Jesus is silent. The high priest asked Jesus why he would not respond to the accusations of the witnesses. And finally, the high priest takes this step where he says, I am placing you under oath of the living God. Are you the Messiah? And you have to know Jesus detested oaths. He thought that your yes should be yes and your no should be no, that there shouldn't be varying levels of honesty based on what words or promises you made about how truthful you were being. And so Jesus responded by saying, your words, not mine. It's amazing how often people try to put words into the mouth of Jesus. Maybe to look, make him look guilty of something or trying to get a stamp of approval on something that they want or they crave. Jesus did say something. He said, you'll see the Son of Man coming, seated at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in clouds of glory. Now, you might think that sounds like a veiled threat. Like, you're the one sitting in charge now, but in a little while, I'm going to be in charge and we'll see how that goes. But that's not what Jesus meant. And that's not what Caiaphas, the high priest, heard. It's not a veiled threat. It was a claim to divinity. And he called it blasphemy. And then the religious leaders began to do something that I would hope would startle us if this began to happen in any religious gathering. They began to spit in his face. They began to slap him in his face. They began to beat him with their fists. This is a devolution of religion, an assumption that the only way to maintain purity of your faith in God is to attack something that you consider less pure. And pent up frustration. They've been mad about this guy for a long time. 
pent up frustration was so high that it just erupted in this emotional explosion and the self-righteous showed absolutely no mercy. Before we get on too high of a horse, the self-righteous today also show no mercy. Say, well, they don't spit and they don't hit and they don't slap. Check your social media. All in the name of purity. The disciples one time had asked Jesus to call fire down out of heaven and destroy a village that they had preached the gospel in and were rejected. Jesus told them they had no idea what spirit was driving them. It's the devolution of religion. We know from Luke's gospel that they had actually blindfolded Jesus at this point so he couldn't see the slaps coming. And they told him to prophesy. So which one of us hit you? Religion at its worst. Punching, slapping, spitting, mocking. And for all of this, Jesus is silent. He won't use the spiritual knowledge that he has to exercise and hurt anyone in the room. And finally, no matter how angry and frustrated you are, eventually you, get, you do get tired and they got weary from their own animosity and so they turned Jesus over to Pilate. And we pick up that story in Matthew 27, beginning in verse 11. It says, meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When they... Uh, when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. governor. Uh, Pilate was a politician, mostly hated by the religious leaders because he had disrespected their faith. They were getting kind of worked up at one point in history and he brought in military into the city and even to some of their sacred places as a way to make sure that riots didn't break out. And it actually made the situation worse. He had to withdraw the military. They, they had no love for this man, but they did find him useful in this trial. And don't miss the sarcasm of Pilate in the midst of all of this. Are you the king of the Jews? You? Jesus standing there with eyes that are now swollen and bruises on his face and lips that are bleeding. Pilate was not impressed by what he saw. He was not in awe. And Jesus responded the same way to Pilate that he had to the high priest. Your words, not mine. Yes, political leaders try to put words in Jesus' mouth too. Sometimes they want to justify an action that they have taken. Or maybe they want to demean a faith or the faithful. Accusation after accusation came against Jesus until Pilate interrupted. And he just says, aren't you going to say anything in your defense? And Jesus remains silent. He simply wouldn't use his power to manipulate or to intimidate others. This is what most people call useless religion. If you can't get what you want and you can't control somebody else, what good is it? That's how lots of people think about religion. And so when they look at Jesus, they see him as powerless, but Jesus is not powerless. Jesus is actually redefining power in that moment. Power is not the ability to strike another person without fear of retaliation. Power is not the ability to manipulate or intimidate others for your benefit. Power is not the ability to take life. Jesus had power where he could actually give life. Power was not for him to make accusations. It was to actually forgive. Power that could absorb what was happening to him and not deter his mission by even a single step, by even a single syllable. Power that is completely undeterred. This kind of power is devastating to devolved religion and self-protecting and self-promoting politicians. They don't know what to do with it. Every single one of them had misused their power a thousand times before Jesus ever showed up in their courtroom. And Jesus doesn't make excuses and he doesn't make accusations. He's just silent. 
This kind of power has to be eliminated. So all that's left is the cross. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 27, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and they took the staff and they struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him and they led him away to crucify him. Just more torture. A little more creative. He thinks he's a king. We'll give him a crown. That's not all. They would take a whip and whip his back until his flesh fell in shards away from his ribcage. And they weren't done then either. They would lay his agonized body down on a cross and they would drive nails into his hands and to his feet. Our world has a very secret belief that if you will take it, you must deserve it. If no one defends, defends you, you must deserve it. This didn't just go on for minutes. It was hours. And then Jesus began to speak. What would he finally say? Why does he have something to say now? Something was happening. Because it was no longer Jesus who was on trial. He did not defend himself when he was on trial. Now others are on trial. Religion that used a claim of passion for purity as an excuse for abuse is on trial. Political leaders that claim no responsibility so they can maintain their office are on trial. Disciples who passionately declared their loyalty to Jesus but then wound up running and hiding and betraying and denying are on trial. People who made false accusations, people who misrepresented the statements of Jesus, people who misquoted him are on trial. Passive bystanders on trial. All of us, all of us are on trial. And the judge of the living and the dead has something to say. What does he have to say? Luke 23, verse 34, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. He is not saying that the religious and politically minded people didn't intend to cause him harm. That's not what he's saying. Listen to the judge of all the earth. He's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't understand what drives them or what paralyzes them. They don't understand what it is that motivates them or intimidates them. Forgive them. Matthew 27, 46 says, about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As all of the sin of the world is now being put upon Jesus, he can no longer sense the presence of his Father. Where are you? I cannot see you. I cannot sense you. I cannot hear you. I have never known a single moment in all eternity separated from your presence, and I cannot find where you are. I can take the pain. I can take the whips. I can take the mocking. I can take the faults of accusation. I can take the nails. I can take the spear. I can take it all. I can't take the absence of your presence. And then he says, with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. Father, I can no longer sense you, but I trust you. 
into your hands. I commit my spirit. And then Jesus is silent again. No more gasp for air. No more words. I'll ask the worship team to come out. If I were to give it a poetic language, I would say that the sun flickered and the earth shook. And in the temple, the veil was torn from top to bottom like a man would tear a t-shirt. The world was about to see the greatest display of power since creation. But that story is for Sunday. Tonight, we remember the cross. If you're in the front row under the chair, if you're in any of the other rows in the seat in front of you, there's the elements of communion. What does Jesus say? He didn't say we're not guilty. Oh, maybe you feel like you are not guilty. Maybe you feel like there's nothing you've really ever done that would warrant the wrath of God. We're not so different from the people in this story. There have been times when we've been offended by a call to serving that we didn't think give us the status we deserved. There have been times when we showed some kind of affection outwardly, but inwardly we never expected to see God or his people again. There have been times when we chose profit over soul care. There have been times when we've misquoted someone else, times when we've remained silent, times when we've denied our faith, times when we just were unwilling to acknowledge what Jesus meant to us. We're all at the cross. Passive bystanders, deniers, runners, hiders, haters, devolved religionist, politically minded, we're all there and we're all guilty. But Jesus says, Father, forgive them. That's what we're here to celebrate. The forgiveness of God. Jesus, when he gathered with his closest friends the night that he was going to be betrayed, gave them a warning. He told them, my body is about to be broken, but it's for you. And a promise is about to be broken too, but another one will be made. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And my blood will bring forgiveness to many. It is what we celebrate at the Lord's table. Father, we ask your blessing on the bread and on the cup. And as we partake of it, let us freshly hear your words that we are forgiven. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all partake of the bread together. And let's all partake of the cup together. Holy Son of God, thank you for being silent in your trial and for lifting your voice in ours. In Jesus' name, amen.